Yeah, this is the very beginning. You can; those are all monarchs that are flying with me. So we were like a river of monarchs for like oh, wow. two minutes, oh, yeah. two, like this. two miles. <laughs> hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns Channel. My name is John Simmerman, and that is Sarah Dykeman, author of the book Bicycling with Butterflies. And we are going to be talking about her ten thousand mile journey uh, to follow the migration patterns of the monarch butterfly. Let's get right to it with Sarah. Sarah Dykeman, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Thanks for the invite. <laughs> Sarah, what I love to do is give my guests an, an opportunity just to give a re really quick 30 second uh, introduction. Uh, so who is Sarah? Uh, I love frogs and I love monarchs and I love adventure. And so I just try and find ways to combine getting out into the world and being a, a voice for these animals that I love. I love that. I love that. Now you say you love them. Is, is that your professional occupation? Are you actively uh, working in that field? Yes. Currently I study frogs for the forest service out in California. Um, but monarchs are part of my life. They'll always be part of my life. And so I'm always rooting for them as well. Yeah. Well, here you are with your froggies. <laughs> so I, I grew up in Northern California. We mentioned this uh, just before I uh, hit the record button. So I grew up on a ranch um, in Northern California in a little town called Lincoln. Uh, and we had our own pond and we had our own little stream running through it. So I, as a kid, I can remember like being fascinated with frogs and, you know, the snakes and amphibians and, and reptiles were, were a big part of my growing up as a young child. And, and playing with that, I, I suspect you're, you're probably going about things a little bit more scientifically. <laughs> what specifically are you studying with amphibians? So my project is a monitoring project on two endangered species, which happen to be the frog in the top right there, um, the mountain yellow-legged frog, and then the middle frog there is called the Yosemite toad. The bottom one is the Pacific tree frog, and they're also amazing. They're probably the ones you saw in your pond. Okay. But the, the two on the top are federally listed. And so my crew and I, we go out and we count every tadpole we can find in this very systematic way. Um, and hopefully we can see trends, either positive or negative, that can hopefully go towards management decisions. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And and you, you are swatting at a fly because you have a fly <laughs> so that's gay. So w <laughs> where's your frog when you need him? You need you somebody to like... <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, but really, uh, as much fun as it is to talk about frogs and and uh, and, and little little creatures. And oh, by the way, uh, I, I am in Austin, Texas. And so we have um, the blind salamander, which is uh, a little endangered uh, little dude. And uh, they hang out at the Barton Springs area. Uh, so very much a part of, of our, you know, world. And we, we have a lot of initiatives to try to, uh, protect the habitat, uh, you know, of these little beloved endangered, uh, species that are out there. Yeah. And Texas, I'm so sorry about this fly. Texas also has the barking frogs and they're super cool because they don't have a tadpole stage. Uh, Everyone thinks all frogs are eggs, tadpoles, adults, but that's not the case. There's, a, there's like... 8,000 species of frogs and thousands of them don't have any tadpole stage at all. They go from eggs and hatch out as little adults. Yeah, yeah. So as you mentioned earlier, that you also love the monarchs. And in fact, uh, the connection to active towns is the bikes <laughs> and the bicycling with butterflies. Uh, this was an absolutely delightful book. Uh, I listened to it on Audible as I was walking around my neighborhood here in Austin. And uh, I just had to reach out to you and, and see if I could get you on the podcast. It took us several months to make this happen. Uh, and so I'm super excited to talk with you about that that combination of bicycling and butterflies. Why don't you set the, the, the scene up in, in terms of this, this book and, and how this all came about? So I've always loved bicycling and I was actually on a bike tour from Bolivia to Texas and I was with a friend and we were about 11 and a half months into our trip and I, uh, we were pretty done with biking at that point, but we were <laughs> in Mexico and I remember thinking, oh, the, the monarchs, they're, you know, they come to Mexico in the winter and that's about all I knew about them and I was like, it'd be fun to see them. 
and it was April. And the monarchs are usually in Mexico from the beginning of November to the like middle of March. And so, and then I looked at the at the map at the route, and it was like the monarchs are over winter at about ten thousand feet above sea level. And so the combination of like probably being late and biking up a ten thousand foot hill was mm. more than I wanted to do. Right. And so I uh, I said let's I'll do it later. And <laughs> that's usually what it takes is like just a little seed of a plan, and yeah, the seed became. I uh, became an idea and then I just picked a time. I yeah. think that's the hardest part on a trip is just saying, I'm going to do this. And you pick a time on the calendar and then you make it yeah. happen. Yeah. And I pulled up a spoon in the road. So this is that trip. This is the one from Bolivia to Texas, right? Yep. Yep. Definitely. H- hardest thing I've ever done. <laughs> uh, a very hard trip. It's that's a sloth there. Yeah. The, you know, people always would ask me when I'm on the other trips, like, are you going to write a book? And I, I never really thought that that was something I wanted to do. Um, and I didn't have a lot to say, like the point for me was to go and see the world and have adventures and meet people and push my body. And, but then on my butterfly trip, I realized like I did have something to say, which was about like supporting, supporting butterflies and seeing the world through the lens of these animals that we love. Yeah. 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 And, and specifically too, I mean, one of the things that I love about this is, um, is that connection of bike riding, seeing things. Um, I, I frequently talk about on the active towns, uh, channel about when you are walking and biking in your community, you, you see it at a much different level. And that theme kept coming up over and over and over again in your book of because you're traveling closer to human speed, you're able to like really feel your environment and you're able to notice things and you frequently will like stop <laughs> and go and and say oh caterpillars over here you know and, and be able to go or or rescue a snake or a frog in this in the street so it's fantastic yeah that's that's the beauty of bike touring and I, I was going like about 50 to 60 miles a day mostly and going slow 10 miles an hour pace like you're going to cover that in six hours. So you have a lot of time to go do other things and uh, see, see what you see. And notice things like this. <laughs> yeah. And like so many times, you know, we think, Oh, we have to go to a national park or we have to go to a, another country to see these like wild creatures doing really incredible things. And then you just stop on the side of the road and you see a beautiful monarch nectarine on a beautiful milkweed and there's this um really amazing relationship between these two animals so the the this is a male monarch and he's nectarine on a milkweed but the female monarchs will find these milkweeds too to lay their eggs and the only food source of monarch caterpillars are these milkweeds and there's lots of different species of them um, but they're toxic to most herbivores but the monarchs can eat the milkweed hold the milkweed toxins in their own body and then they become poisonous. And so the bright orange is warning predators, hey, when I was a caterpillar, I ate toxic milkweed. I'm toxic. Don't mess with me. And so there's just this really amazing, like, ecological, like, phenomenon happening in our own backyards on our own side of the road. And all we have to do is step outside and notice. Yeah. And the, and the premise of the book and really what you're doing is you are following the, 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 the butterfly. So talk about that and, and talk about that origin of that idea of, oh, I know what I'll do. Since I didn't get enough of bike riding going from Bolivia to, to Texas, I'm going to like, I'm going to follow the migration of, of these little doodads. <laughs> talk about that. Yeah. The, so the monarch migration is really incredible. They, all the monarchs born pretty much from the Rocky Mountains to the Atlantic seaboard, they go to the small little forest in Mexico where they hang from the trees. And that's that blue dot there in Mexico. Uh, and then in the spring, they re-migrate north where the milkweed has re-emerged after a winter of dormancy and they lay their eggs and then they die. So I followed about between three and five generations of monarchs on their route. And each part of their migration, the monarchs had different needs and kind of had actually different like like the monarchs that are born in the fall, they are non-reproductive. They're going to fly all the way back to Mexico. They're going to go to that forest having never been there before. And so me 
biking with them, I could look at an egg on the side of the road and be like, I maybe I saw your great great grandma, or I could say, oh my gosh, you're gonna potentially fly to Mexico and you've never been there before. And so I kind of added that, like the human scale to things, because it's easy to look at a map and be like, cool, butterfly flies from Michoacan to Texas. But then when you're actually, when you see a cyclist that's just biked from Michoacan to Texas, you're like, ah. And so I think it kind of helps, it helps bring the distance and the scale into the picture. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was about what, 10,000 miles around trip, right? Yeah. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. Eight and a half months. So you make your way all the way up, uh, all the way up to Canada, right? Yep. Yeah. The, I tried to, I tried to kind of get every corner of the, of at least the Eastern Monarch uh, migration. So you can see that the whole North America or U S in this picture is, has yellow for the, where they overwinter in the summer or spend the summer. (laughs) Yeah. But the Rocky mountains kind of divides them into two, to two groups. So I was following the Eastern Monarchs. And you were following the Eastern Monarchs uh, heading that way. And here's you, here's you on, on your rig. And this is, this is kind of a little bit of your journey. Uh, you, it didn't sound like you had a whole lot of single track and, and major off-road. It seemed like it, in listening to the book that a good, the majority of it was probably on some form of paved roads and maybe some gravel roads. Um, but this is a really cool shot. <laughs> yeah, this is the very beginning. You can, those are all monarchs that are flying with me. So we were like a river of monarchs for like oh, wow. two minutes, oh, yeah. two, minutes, like two miles. <laughs> there they are. That is so cool. Yeah. You are, we you are literally biking day. with the butterflies. <laughs> yeah. And then they kind of ditched me and I didn't actually see all that many monarchs on my trip. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like the point, like, well, I guess when I made my trip, I used, um, like, crowdsourced monarch tracking data and so I could kind of see but what I saw when I was looking at all the different monarch tracking uh, maps was that some years they they go more east some years they go more west some years they fly north quickly some years they stay south longer and so it was just a wild guess my route that's my route there but the, but I always would tell people the point wasn't actually to see the monarchs. It was to see the people that could help the monarch. And so literally every single person I saw every single day for eight and a half months could help. Yeah. Um, and that was the point. Yeah, it, that that definitely was the point. It had a profound impact on me, too, because uh, we, we do a good job in our front yard here, uh, which gets a, a good deal of sun. And we have it planted in, in a whole mixture of different flowering plants, a, a, a bunch of different sages and that have some flowers on them. And then uh, quite a few other uh, bushes out there that just bring in the pollinators. It's just so really absolutely cool to see all the bees, different different species of bees and different species of, of butterflies coming in. Um, and, uh, I did buy a couple of packets of, of milkweed. Uh, and so I, I want to try to get those growing. I don't even know if they'll grow here in, in Austin. I don't even know if I got the right species of, of milkweed. You know, I know there's tons of them, but I tried to like zone in on what I thought would work. Um, so I've got those seeds. I think I have them in the refrigerator, um, kind of resting in, in, at this point and you kind of in, in, in that mode, when should I plant those? So you want to think about planting, you want to look out at what nature's doing. So right now the milkweeds are going to seed and then those seeds are going to rest on the ground all winter. So that's kind of where the refrigerator comes in. Um, It's called cold stratification. So the, the seeds have to know, like, you don't want them to sprout now because the frost would come and kill them. Uh, so they're waiting for winter. And so some people will just put seeds on the ground in the fall and they'll let the seeds do their thing. And in the spring, hopefully they'll come up. That's a little bit more challenging because when every plant comes up in the spring, it's hard to tell one from the other. And native plants, there's like a, a mantra with native planting that's the sleep, creep, leap. So it's a very slow process in the beginning. Um, much of the, the growth is actually below ground. So those milkweeds are putting down long tap roots so they can survive the summer. Um, so you'll look at them and you'll be getting impatient. Um, but one of my strategies is to you put them in the fridge like you're doing. And then in the spring, 
take them out and plant them. Uh, I like to plant them actually in little pots so that I can see them come up and I know, okay, the only plant in this pot will be a milkweed. And then I put them around some milkweeds, especially in Texas. Like I know uh, from talking to lots of gardeners in Texas that the soil is hard to dig. And so sometimes it's best just to put that seed directly in your shovel can't penetrate down and get um, deep enough for the, for water, but um, a root can. And so, you know, like um, antelope horn milkweed and green milkweed, often just putting those in the ground, letting them do the hard work of the digging is the best case. Yeah. Yeah. And the area that I'm thinking about putting it, because I'm assuming it, it needs pretty good sunlight. Is that typically the case? Most of them. Yeah. Yeah. Because in the backyard, we've got, it's mostly shade because of the pecan trees. And so I'm like, well, yeah, probably out front will be better. And it, it is going to be a little bit of a, a battle because there's lots of Texas wildflowers that are already popping up every spring there. So you never you, you never know where this conversation is going to go. So we went from riding bikes on this amazing journey to, OK, when do I plant my milkweed? <laughs> uh, here's here's you on your rig once again. And I want to zoom in again on, on this because uh, I love the fact that your uh, your makeshift little panniers say one less car. Yay. Um, yeah. That's that's another part of what really attracted me to your story is the fact that, you know, a big part of what um, I'm trying to do and advocating for globally is, you know, what we can all do to try to make our environment more conducive for active mobility and getting more people out of their cars, on bikes. Um, it, it's good for us. It's good for the planet. It's good for, apparently, it's good for the butterflies. Tell us more. Yeah, I love I love biking in towns. Um and there's a big difference between biking in a town that is trying to support active transportation and towns that aren't. And I've lived in all, all of them, but there's just nothing better than using your own body to get somewhere and like, you know, jumpstarting your, your heart and being waking up and being ready for the day. And that's been, that was my life for a long time. I was, that was really important to me. And I went when I went to school in Northern California at Humboldt State University and my entire crew, we were bicyclists that we you know we went to the city council meetings and demanded uh, bike paths. And we tried to make commuting by bike and bus fun. And, and, it, and it is. Um, yeah, I love it. Yeah, because you could have you could have just as easily followed that migration in a car. You didn't have to do it this way, but. Mm. Knowing you and the fact that this was just the next adventure that you did, of course you did it by bike. Yeah, the monarch migration uh, progresses, not not an individual butterfly, but like the front of monarchs is about 60 miles a day in the spring. And that's just the perfect distance for a cyclist, in my opinion, bike touring. And yeah, a car, you're not going to see the milkweed, you're not going to see the butterflies. You're probably going to hit a few. I think there's a study that came out, it's like, forget what it was. 1% of the monarch population is killed by cars each year. Yeah. Um, one of the, the other wonderful things about the book too is, and you sort of alluded to it earlier, is that a big part of the journey and a big part of the book was about the people along the way that you would meet. Some of them were programmed and planned out, but then others were just chance meetings. And then, uh, and then you also took the time to also uh, share the story with a lot of children. So talk a little bit about the human factor of this, of, of the, the people that you, you know, kind of coordinated to meet as well as those chance meetings. And then also, uh, speaking with children along the way. Yeah. So my other trips that I've done often involved, uh, going to schools and talking to kids. Uh, and so I did have that focus in the beginning, but then, about maybe like a quarter of the way through my trip, I just realized the monarchs were up against so much. And the reality was just so brutal. And I was so mad at the world. Um, and so I wanted to use my voice to help in a bigger way. And so I started giving presentations to nature centers and at libraries. And that just opened up this whole other network of folks. And I didn't charge for my presentations. I would just ask, oh, I just need a place to shower. <laughs> And so I would, I stayed with, I think, 68 families on my trip that most of them I had never met before. 
Um, and so that was just a way of, of connecting. And also those 68 people were often the people that were on the ground uh, fighting. You know, I wasn't actually helping the monarchs in a lot of ways. I wasn't putting milkweed in the ground. I wasn't protecting public space or wild spaces. Um, but I got to see all these people that cared and were fighting. And it really just helped kind of calm the anger. And then I met folks like this man who just stopped me on the side of the road and asked me, what I'm doing. And sometimes I would be very annoyed and would not want to talk. And it's just like hot and I'm hot and tired. But uh, often those encounters are what you remember more than any of the miles. And this guy asked if I wanted ice cream and I won't forget him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. And, uh, and, and to that point, I mean, you, and, and here's a trend, is this another ice cream? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I ate a lot of ice cream. Yeah, good, good move too. Um, but yeah, to your point, I mean, one of the, the endearing things about the book too were some of those stories of where um, you would have that conversation. They they would say, "What? What are you doing?" And you would explain why you're doing it, what you're doing, and why you're doing it. Um, and I think that that's just so it's so beautiful when you really step back and think about it because it gives you that opportunity, you know, to try to share the vision, share what you're doing. And it, it crosses nationalities. It crosses, um, political divides. It, it, it gives, it's like rehumanizing that, that interaction talking about. Right. A butterfly. Yeah. And the monarchs are so good at that too. They're so democratic. There's not a lot of animals in the world that you don't have to drive a car to go see, you know, in a national park or in another country or a zoo even. Uh, the monarchs come to everyone. So I saw them in small, I saw them in farm fields in Texas. I saw them at uh, suburban schools in Omaha. I saw them in New York City. And so they really, they really let everyone be part of this migration. Yeah, yeah. I love this shot here too, because it's, you, you've got the caterpillar in the foreground on the, on the milkweed and it looks like you're getting off. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, I got it. <laughs> that's but that's then fantastic. If, if you go a few more, this is like, this picture is a, a classic, awesome picture of a caterpillar being a cool caterpillar doing super amazing things. You can see how the caterpillar uh, actually cut the leaf vein so that the, the leaf they're currently eating is like bent and that's to stop the flow of the milky latex that gives milkweed its name but then if you keep going one more like this is just what we're up against and so it's like one minute you see the world through the caterpillar's eyes and you think yes there's all this habitat here perfect and then five minutes later you're getting kicked in the face and i was going 10 miles an hour i couldn't escape it you can't just drive fast and turn on the radio and ignore what's happening you're just right there and i was just i was so mad so much of the time because that's it's just not fair that's the last habitat these monarchs have especially in places like iowa um and nebraska where it's just corn from road to road yeah yeah and it's so senseless too and and i i suspect a big part of what you're trying to do and we're trying to do with this is is education of trying to you know say to folks hey hold off on that don't mow that Right. And it's not that we can't mow. Like the, if we think about the prairie as a system, they bison were mowing the prairie forever. So the prairie is set up to get mowed, quote unquote. The key is thinking about monarchs when we're thinking about our mowing regime. So like right now um, it's fall and the, every single monarch that's being that's going to fly to Mexico has to arrive fat enough, having eaten as much nectar as possible to survive all winter, just living off their fat reserves. And so if we mow Texas and Missouri right now, we're mowing away all the nectar sources. If we wait until October when they're gone, then the plants have gone to seed, the nectar is, you know, has been produced, the seeds have been um, set, and then you mow. But this is, yeah, like this picture, it's unacceptable. Like, this is the monarch's planet. We have to learn to share. We have to learn to find places. I'm not. Um, I'm not saying we can't have grass. I'm not saying we can't, you know, have picnics or soccer fields or corn for, for what we need corn for. But, like, there has to be some give, and we've just t taken and taken and taken, and like we've just we've left the monarchs nothing, and that's just not okay. It's not okay. 
One of the things that, that and here's, here's you uh, speaking in front of a, a group of children here. One of the things that uh, has been emerging on my channel, I've noticed, uh, especially traveling around the world, uh, interviewing city staff that are building out the bicycle networks. One of the things that I've started to notice is that there has been a commitment from many of these cities to, uh, A, sort of depave a little bit create a little bit more nature. And in that, you know, in those areas, they're, they're thinking now about a uh, stormwater runoff. They're thinking about, you know, having rain gardens and they're not planting turf graf- grass in there. They're actually, you know, figuring out, okay, what are some of the, you know, you know, wild indigenous uh, flowering, you know, wildflowers that could help with some of this. And so I, I can't tell you how many times this, this uh, summer, I spent two months in Europe uh, filming over there and meeting with folks and was just blown away, uh, especially, you know, since I've been back year after year after year over the past 10 years to see this. And I'm like, I saw more wildflowers blooming you know, of all places like Utrecht in the Netherlands. And this is, yeah, no, we, we've, we, this is like a, a move that the city is doing to try to bring more, you know, more pollinators back and to have more, you know, a wilder sort of approach to it. So what used to be turf grass, what used to be this stuff is now like wild and flowering. And I thought about you and, and I'm like, yeah, I gotta, have, I gotta mention this to Sarah. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And that's, that's a good point too. Like, Monarchs also share this need that cyclists have where you can't just have the start and the end be good. Like if there's a nice bike lane in one town and there's a nice bike lane in the other town, but then there's a scary bridge in the middle. Well, like no one can, no one can do that. It's, I mean, or very few people will want to. And so the monarchs are the same. You can have a, a pollinator garden here and a pollinator garden there, but if they're not connected by suitable habitat or by safety, then it's kind of worthless. So have, finding these ways of making corridors is really important. And people are also doing that with interstates, uh, with roads, um, bike paths would be are awesome too. And I mean, biking on a bike path with flowers is awesome. <laughs> Oh, I love it. I mean, it's it's one of the things that makes makes it so you know rich and enjoyable for sure. Uh, talk a little bit about that interaction that takes place with students. I mean, I was thinking about this earlier today. It's like. Um, in some ways, this is this is kind of a, a, a very interesting and 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 cool, and maybe even a little bit uh, easier task because you're talking about butterflies. You're talking about these beautiful, you know, things in nature. Uh, it'd be one thing if you were trying to, you know, educate about the the value of, of a cockroach, and. And I'm sure there are some, <laughs> for sure. Uh, they have their place too. But how much of that like really helps with this? Because I think it's probably pretty universal with kids that it's like, oh, we're talking butterflies? Yay! Yeah, butterflies and bikes. I always say I'm living the like a 10-year-old's dream. But yeah, I call monarchs gateway bugs because it happens so consistently that people will plant a milkweed for monarchs for the because they want to see a bright yellow or bright orange, excuse me, butterfly, and then they'll see the caterpillars and then they'll, they'll kind of fall in love with the beauty of a caterpillar. And then while they're looking for caterpillars, they see the spider and they see how cute they are. And then they start to see all the other creatures and you've just sort of like had your hand held and been like, it's okay. Like come into this world. Uh, it's not so scary. And so, yeah, the, the monarchs are, because they, because anyone can help because they go to so many different places and because they're beautiful, they really just like offer people a, a stepping stone into nature. So yeah, they're, they're a spokesperson for sure as well. Yeah. When you look at, you know, the challenges ahead of us in terms of, you know, climate change and, and global warming and, and how quickly things are kind of moving. Um, I, I keep wondering about this is like, especially here in, in, in Texas, where we just have brutally, brutally hot summers, you know, to the point where you're like, okay, you know, we're, we're, we're basically cooking the, you know, the outside environment. You know, that's gotta be just devastatingly hard on, you know, populations such as monarch butterflies and colonies. Yeah, the the extremes for all creatures is very hard. And it's just a matter of time before it will be too extreme. 
the the monarchs are really cool in the fact that they're they're hyper resilient. So because they spread out, you know, they're in lot. Well, in Mexico, they're they're fairly vulnerable to us, you know, habitat loss. But they have a lot of places to go, and because they spread out, maybe it's a bad year in eastern Texas, but a good year in western Texas. And so there's these opportunities for them to rebound. And because it's a five generation migration, potentially. If one female arrives in Texas and she can find monarchs tend to lay about one egg per milkweed, so and they lay about 500 eggs. So if she can find 500 milkweeds, then there's a good chance that two or three of those will survive, and thus it's like doubled the population in one generation. And by the time you get to the fifth generation, you've got a lot more monarchs. So there's a chance, there's a good chance for this high resiliency, high high um, recovery, but it only works if each monarch can find 500 milkweeds. And right now they can't. And like I biked through Texas in 20, well, my trip was in 2017. And then I did a motorcycle tour uh, in 2022, I think. And I just saw, I, I couldn't believe the difference, how much development had happened, how much habitat loss had taken place. So it's just, yeah, this, this map here, or this graph here, excuse me, has that dotted green line. And um, that's a sustainable monarch population, which is about six hectares or about, about 14 and a half acres of monarchs in Mexico. Um, they don't count numbers, they count the area they take up. But in order to get to that green line, scientists believe we need to plant 1.8 billion stems of milkweed. Wow, yeah. So that's like all hands on deck. We cannot just wait for national parks and state parks and wildlife refuges to get this going. Like it, the only way we'll have a resilient monarch population is if they have lots of milkweed choices. And that means milkweed everywhere. Yeah. So one of the, the, the projects that you have, you know, ventured out on is like trying to collect better data down in Mexico. Uh, does it make sense for us to play that, uh, that video right now about counting? Yeah, it'd be fun to okay. Let's watch it. Let's scientists do that. In action. Yeah. Hello, I'm Sarah. After biking alongside monarchs and milkweed for 10,000 miles, I launched my book, Bicycling with Butterflies. Meanwhile, I spent my winters in Mexico making friends, celebrating weddings, picnicking, farming beans, painting houses, enjoying birthdays, learning to cook and bake and build and somersault, and of course visiting the monarchs. The more time I spent with the butterflies, the more I learned. The more I learned, the more questions I had, which is why I started a research project and is why today I'm asking for your support. I'm raising money to continue my research, understanding the overwintering monarch's streaming behavior. Now, you have probably two reactions. It's either, yeah, sign me up, or it's, uh, streaming behavior? A quick explanation. Most of the winter, monarchs in Mexico are inactive. Then, each spring, their winter home starts to warm up and dry out. This spurs the monarchs into action. In the weeks leading up to their remigration north, the monarchs leave their clusters daily and stream down the mountains, likely to seek water, drink nectar, and to jumpstart their reproductive development. As the season progresses, they stream further and further. They stream beyond the most protected core of the forest and into the communities where people live. People like Lola, Leticia, Maria, Doran Alfonso, and Ava, who are just some of the people I trained and then employed in 2020 to count monarchs that stream past specific transects near their homes three times daily. With a watch, a notebook, and a weather logger placed at each house, these families and I were able to conduct the first ever research on streaming behavior. In just six weeks, we recorded 38,000 streaming monarchs and their corresponding weather conditions. Such an accomplishment would have been impossible for one person alone. At the end of the season, I crunched the numbers from this preliminary study and found that basically, wahoo, yeah, my methodology works and can be expanded out and repeated, which is exactly what I want to do. 
I want to return to Mexico this winter and repeat my study, only I want to go bigger. I want to study monarchs the entire overwintering season, and I want to invite not just 10 families to participate, but 21. I also want to add these really cool data loggers so that we can add wind speed, wind direction, and solar radiation to the mix. Continuing to collect this data will be a win for participants and their families because they'll get to be scientists and work from home to earn a modest income. It will also be a win for the butterflies because it creates sustainable jobs which help take extractive pressures like logging off their forest. And continuing will help answer questions about overwintering ecology and climate change effects, which of course is a win for science. It's basically a win-win-win project. The Monarchs have shown me that there is this passionate team of people rallying to give the Monarchs a future. I'm calling on this network today to help fund my project in Mexico. Every donation counts, just like every Monarch counts. So please give what you can, share with your friends and family, and thank you so, so much for helping make this project possible. Love it. Love it. Uh, so what's the update on that? Obviously, the, that was produced a little while ago. Oh, those data, those data loggers are the test the vein of my existence. <laughs> uh, but they're awesome. Yeah, so I've done two more two more winters, I guess. Um, I got up to 21 women counting. We have so much data. This last year, um, I trained um, a friend and now colleague to kind of do my job for me because I got a permanent job in California and we have a meeting tomorrow. We've started uh, working with a nonprofit as well to get um, a little bit more legal on the <laughs> taxes and all that uh, stuff. But yeah, it's been really cool. Like last year, the, the monarch population was the second lowest recorded. Oh, gosh. Um, yeah. we, we hit less than a hectare of monarchs and the data was just there. Like, the, mon the women were counting way, 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 way fewer monarchs than they had the year before. And so I'm hoping I just can keep going and we can keep getting this baseline information and, and add it to our knowledge. And I just have to share one story. They had a, like a picnic or a meeting with food. Um, I wasn't there, but I called in and they were, all the women were just such scientists talking about what they'd noticed and what they were curious about. And it was really awesome. That is so cool. Not only are you, are you like engaging them and giving them an opportunity to earn a little bit, but you're, you're also sparking that, that knowledge of science and, and getting them interested in, in the world around them like that. That's, that's so incredibly cool. Yeah, I'm happy. I just need, I'm working, if anyone knows anyone that can make apps, I've been trying to figure out a way to make an app so that we can just do the, do the data without data sheets. Cause ah, yeah. entering, I was entering, it, was, it took me about 10 hours a week to enter the data that I would get. Yeah. Um, it's a lot. Okay. <laughs> we're we're manifesting that. We're putting this out here on YouTube. Uh, folks, if you're watching this or listening to this, because it's also going out in podcast, uh, traditional podcast uh, format as well. Uh, if you know people who are app developers who can help out with this great cause, uh, please reach out to Sarah and let her know. Uh, and so, yeah, we, we, we've got the counting uh, of the monarchs that are out there. There is a, I believe there's a donate button here, right? Yeah, support the monarchs. You can yeah, make a donation it here. Yeah, uh, go fund me. Okay, fantastic. And that that is able to be done there. So please consider supporting. Any other bike adventures coming up for you? <laughs> Oh, I've got a permanent job. It's hard. My first permanent job ever. But I'm I just moved to closer to the office and I'm now I'm a twenty four minute bike ride from the office. So if I get to commute by bike. It is a doozy. It's a four hundred feet of climbing each way in uh two and a half miles. So or three and a half miles. But it feels good to be back on a bike. So that's my adventure. Finally getting to commute again. <laughs> Finally getting to commute again. Uh, I guess going downhill, going home, probably a little bit easier. No, it, It's straight down and then straight up. <laughs> and then so on the way home, it's straight down and then straight up. Well, there you go. Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, 25 mile an hour speed limit. Um, cars go 50, but I feel like a little more like confident in my ability to, you know, take the road because it's, it's posted at 25. Yeah. So. Man. Wow. 
Any final thoughts from your end about, uh, you know, the work that you're doing, uh, the challenges ahead and uh, and how people can continue to engage with uh, with this challenge that we have in front of us? I mean, I, or if you're speaking about biking, that's one challenge and then protecting the monarchs is another um, I think just when you're out and about, notice the world around you, be curious, ask questions. And I think like if anyone has a, an idea for a trip or an idea to be, you know, part of the solution, like don't worry about being an expert. Don't worry about getting it all right. Like the, the pieces will fall together. Um, the failures will be funny stories down the road and you'll meet lots of people like trying and working on my projects have just given me so many stories and opportunities. And, and I mean, quite frankly, like I have a book, I have money from this. So like, you never know where things will lead, but you gotta, you gotta start. The first mile is always the hardest. Yeah. Yeah. And these, these last few photos too, is, is kind of like, one of the things that I love so much about this book was like the stories and the vignettes that you had about people who were going out of their way to, you know, create environments, which encourage again, those pollinators to come and hang out. Yeah. And like, I guess I could end with the, this picture here is of uh, Nadia in Columbia, Missouri, and her yard was just this amazing Mecca. Like so much life was there only because of the choices she made. And then at her neighbor's yard, there was these little common milkweeds poking up. And she said that the, mo the neighbors used to mow everything. And then they learned if there's no milkweed, there's no monarchs. So they mow around those milkweeds. And so literally we need people kind of breaking status quo, trying new things, reinventing what beautiful is on, on every street. And then that's how our ideas spread. That's how the milkweed spreads. That's how change happens. So if you can be that brave person to start a new way of thinking, I, uh, I would be grateful. The monarchs would be grateful. So yeah. go what's, for it. what's funny too, about this particular photo is you see, uh, you know, some turf grafts and then you see some, you know, some plants, you know, popping up. There's a few houses here in my neighborhood where every spring, you know, the, their, their turf grass is, is there and they continue to mow their turf grass. But then in the spring, all the wildflowers start popping up. And because the wildflowers are so cherished and beloved here, they let it grow. And so they, they stop mowing their lawn at that, at that time point in time and eventually once the, the the wildflowers are up and they're starting to bloom and everything they'll go back and they still kind of like you know do a little spot mowing and so it looks a lot like this where it's like the turf grass has been mowed but then the wildflowers are like doing their thing and uh you know i'd prefer the whole thing be you know planted and a whole bunch of you know wilderness but uh uh, this, this makes me laugh because that reminds me of that. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think a few paths, a place to play with a dog, that's all good. And, uh, a chaotic garden can look very intentional with a few good mode edges. <laughs> yeah. 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 I love it. I love it. This has been so much fun. Uh, Sarah, thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast for this little uh, joy ride uh, on your journey following the, uh, the streaming and migration patterns of the monarch butterfly. Yeah, it was fun to chat. Thank you. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Sarah Dykeman. If you did, please, hey, give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on the subscription button down below and ring that notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content here on the Active Towns channel, please consider supporting my efforts. Uh, it's easy to do. Just head on over to activetowns.org, click on the support button. And if you decide to become a Patreon supporter, uh, patrons, you do get early and ad-free access access to all this content. And uh, I have to tell you, it means so incredibly much to me. I simply could not do this without your support. So please consider becoming an Active Towns ambassador. Well, until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.